Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this, the 15th event of this year's Unbound Book Festival. My name is Alex George, and I am the director of the festival. Uh, tonight's event uh, is one of the panels that we put together to recognize 2021 as Missouri's bicentennial, and this is called, perhaps just a tiny bit predictably, Show Me Stories. But you are in for a wonderful e evening with some fabulous authors. As you may know, the festival has always been completely free to attend, uh, whether in person or online, and this wouldn't be possible without the, the financial support of hundreds and hundreds of people who have supported us over the years. And if you go to the website, uh, unboundbookfestival.com, you'll see a list of everyone who has given over the last two years. It's a very long list and we are very grateful. Support comes too from the Office of Cultural Affairs and the Convention and Visitors Bureau. And we're also very grateful to the Boone Electric Cooperative Foundation and the Assistance League of Mid-Missouri for their support. Particular thanks uh, this evening goes to tonight's sponsor, Restoration Eye Care. We're very grateful to them for their continued support of the festival over the years. Unbound, as you probably know, is all about audience interaction, and we would love you to join in the conversation tonight, just as you would if we were gathering in person. So please feel free to post questions for the authors in the chat box, and we will get to them towards the end of the session. And to encourage you to participate, we will be, as usual, uh, uh, selecting one uh, person who has uh, asked a question, and they will be receiving uh, a copy of each of the panelists' most recent books. Please remember that if you miss an event, uh, everything is available for viewing or reviewing uh, on both our fa uh, Facebook page and also our YouTube channel. We still have seven events left in this year's festival, and please do check out the remainder of the schedule on the website. Again, that's unboundbookfestival.com. And while you're there, please consider signing up for the e-newsletter, which goes out every Monday, uh, telling you about events to expect that week. Housekeeping is done, so it's now my great pleasure to welcome Becky Smith, uh, tonight's moderator from KBIA. Becky, hi, how are you? Hi, Alex. I'm doing well tonight. How about yourself? I am great. Very much looking forward to this. Oh, me um, too. I will take off and I'll, I'll, let you, uh, I'll let you take over. Great. Well, thanks so much, Alex. Thanks so much to Alex and also to a uh, fellow board member, Takia Thomas, uh, for asking me to step in and moderate this great panel tonight. I'm very excited about it. Um, Missouri is something that is deep, deep in the blood. I'm born and bred Missourian from South Central Missouri. Um, and my love of Missouri, I hope, uh, shines through not only in the books that I choose to read, but also in the work that I choose to do with KBIA. Uh, and, and so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, what we're going to do tonight is we'll just talk a little bit about what the Panel's going to be. I'll introduce each of our authors, and those introductions will be followed uh, by a short reading from their uh, short story collections. We'll then jump into some questions, and I'll be sure to leave plenty of time um, at the end for questions from our audience. So, just uh, to take it a little bit, uh, just a little further from Alex, our panel tonight is Show Me Stories. So, we'll be talking about short story collections by Missouri authors and set in Missouri locations. It was so nice to be able to identify specific streets and places and uh, feelings that were uh, mentioned in all three of these collections. Our panel description is that Missouri contains a rich history of storytelling, maybe Mark Twain. Uh, the writers on this panel engage with and redefine the narrative tradition of that show me state. They discuss where they live and how that informs their writing and share how they create imagined lives that reflect the real complexities of our state. So up first is Ron Austin, uh, who has written Avery Colt as a snake, a thief, a liar. Ron is an author that was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. He told me that he decided he was ready to be a writer when he was taking a philosophy class in high school, and he read Black Boy by Richard Wright. He still lives in St. Louis with his wife, Jenny, and his son, Elijah, and teaches at WashU. Uh, I have to ask everyone when I speak to them how they're staying sane during this uh, pandemic year, and he told me that his class load <laughs> keeps him from going stir crazy. He's had short stories that have been placed in Boulevard, Pleiades, Story Quarterly, Ninth Letter, Black Warrior Review, and other journeys. But Avery Colt as a Snake, a Thief, a Liar is his first collection. It's been recognized many times with numerous awards, including the 2017 Nelson Prize, the 2020 Devil's Kitchen Reading Award, the 2020 Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize nomination, and a 2020 Hurston Wright Legacy Award nomination. So without further ado, 
Ron, I'm going to be quiet and let you read to us from your collection. Avery Colt is a snake, a thief, a liar. All right. Well, thanks for that introduction, Becky. Uh, thanks to everyone uh, for being here. So I'm going to start off, um, I'm going to read a couple of openings from uh, two different stories. So I'm going to start off by reading something newer uh, that's coming from an issue of Black Warrior Review. So I'll jump into that one and then I'll read an Avery Colt story. This one is Muscled Clean Out the Dirt. Salesmen from Catacombs Incorporated couldn't solve every ghetto problem. They offered no solutions for gross poverty, quick death, or the weariness that congests heads and chests like a brutal cold. But they did offer one product that could restore blighted North St. Louis neighborhoods. Geb's magic red bricks. Nobody asked how those sales could haul wooden carts heavy with hundreds of bricks, bulky arms straining under cheap suits, halos of sweat adorning bald heads. Nobody asked why only the finest women could buy a brick. Nobody asked why the bricks were irregular, some of them bloated with muscle and green veins, some of them sporting coarse pubic hair, all of them pulsing with the faint heartbeat of a wounded animal. Nobody consulted apocryphal books of the Bible, divine explanations from prophetic dreams, scattered chicken bones. Nobody asked how the bricks could flex and twitch. So the finest women spent the whole summer commanding their husbands, brothers, uncles, sons, and grandsons to commandeer the remains of vacant lots and condemned houses, slice machetes and hatchets through bramble and boughs of honeysuckle, bang sledgehammers through crumbling walls and cracked foundations, cart off rubble and junk, dump shovels in hard earth, and so Geb's magic red bricks where the land had been raided, salted, turned to soot. All right, and so that is a bit from that story. And now I'll move into reading the opening of the last story in Avery Colt. This one is <clears throat> Nobody Promised Milk and Honey. Before the corner store failed, Grandma used to sit out front and gut buckets of fresh catfish Granddad had caught that morning. Those catfish flopped over each other, fins slapping, mouths gasping, gills slicing open into long red slits. She'd pull a paring knife from her apron, set down newspaper, and clean them right there on the curb. Sludge dripping guts glowed in the sun, a clutch of bruised rubies. Once she had the fish frying inside, she'd stand in the doorway and hawk lunch specials. She'd be hollering, come and get it, come and get it. Fresh big lip catfish straight out the muddy Mississippi. Hang a tooth on that cornmeal crust. Hot sauce and onions ain't never had a better friend. I said, come on y'all, them pans is burning up. That grease is popping. Them catfish is jumping. Boy, is they jumping. Truth is, I wanted my first job to be at grandma and granddad's corner store so I could rattle open those iron gates at dawn, fire up that oil drum smoker and squint as coal snapped the chorus. I wanted to shave cloudy chunks of ice for snow cones, pickle hot peppers harvested from grandma's garden, roast chicken bones and gizzards for that good gravy. I wanted to sneak rings from the toy machine to young kids and hope aluminum hearts might ward off misfortune. I wanted to ride my bike and deliver platters of snoots, neck bones, and ham hocks. I wanted to holler lunch specials at day laborers, less lottery tickets, and haggle over dusty cans of sweet yams with mean, goat-bearded women who knew how to stretch a dollar further than Laffy Taffy. For real, I'd smooth wrinkles out of sweat-soaked dollars sourced from the heels of boots, the bottom of bras, ignore that damp funk and praise working folks. At the end of each day, I douse the coals, rattle the iron gate closed, balance the book by dusk light. Grandma would peep over my shoulder while granddad scraped burnt bone out of the smoker. She'd laugh bitterly, pop one of those pathetic bills and tell me, hey, Avery, boy, it's raggedy, but it's still money, ain't it? And that's it, thank you.
Thank you, Ron, so much for sharing those selections with us. I really appreciate it. And I really loved the collection. Next up, we have RM uh, or Rosemary Kinder, and she's from Bloomfield in Stoddard County, Missouri, which I suspect most of you have probably never, never heard of. Um, it's a part of the Boot Heel, which you're probably more familiar with. She spent 20 years in Tucson before returning to Missouri in 1989 to teach at the University of Central Missouri in Warrensburg. She says she can't recall not wanting to be a writer, and she wrote songs and poems as a child and then continued until she was finally able to study creative writing. Rosemary is creative beyond just the written word, and she impressed me in our communications before tonight by informing me that she plays the acoustic bass, guitar, mandolin, mountain dulcimer, and even a little harmonica. So I believe that Rose Marie will be reading from her uh, third short story collection, A Common Person and Other Stories. Rose Marie, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I think it's an honor. I love everything I've learned about the Un Unbound Book Festival, and I want to thank everybody who volunteers, who founded it, who participates, and, and the technicians at Tell Us Ready, and the audience. I, I think you can't do anything without a good audience, and so bless you all. I'm going to read from a um, just a short part of the title story in A Common Person, and I'm going to start about the second page in. This woman has made uh, and retracted a statement on Facebook that she regretted, and she was afraid to get it in trouble, and it did. And uh, here we go. They came for her after seven in the midst of a televised update on the president-elect's last outrageous tweet. She heard the car pulling into the driveway, heard two doors shut. She, she turned off the television and stood back from the front door. A horizontal oblong window allowed her to see them approaching. They wore suits. How ridiculous to be so obvious, but then that was a kind of honesty. Suddenly, she wanted to text her daughter in California and say, I posted a joke about guns and I'm afraid I'm in trouble. She didn't have time to text anything. They were knocking. The men were courteous and upfront, simply responding to a concern raised by a Facebook post. In a short time, she was in the back seat of their car, one of them beside her. They had her cell phone, her purse, and the medication she had been allowed to gather. They had also her two revolvers, the scant ammunition, and a fishing knife she had been given long ago and kept in the nightstand drawer. I'm not a well woman, she said to the man next to her. He was blonde and very lean with a sharp nose. I have to stay calm. You're not in any danger, he said. This is a process and will be over soon. You just need to answer some questions and give people time to check your answers. It's a scary process from my end of it and unnecessary. I can answer questions from my house. She had already explained three times that the post meant nothing, was a kind of joke. And she had deleted it because she realized it wasn't funny and could leave the wrong impression. I want to phone my daughter later. I protest, she said, and focused on the terrain on small points as she might have done if she suffered from motion sickness. We have a facility in Kansas City, the man in the front said. It's very comfortable. You'll have dinner, bed, whatever you need. That meant she was staying, no telling how long. What about my dog and my cats? I have two cats who are probably home now. They'll be taken care of. The need to cry and run swelled in her chest, so she gulped for air, but didn't turn her head away from the window. They passed deep fields, twilight softening the shapes into shadows. Fireflies flickered. She saw a mare and colt, saw cattle, cars passed them, headlights cut the night ahead. The flatland turned into gentle hills. Her fear became more a pulse, and she could think in the dips. In at least a day or two, her daughter would begin to worry and would take steps to locate her mother. She wasn't really alone or at the mercy of strangers. This was America, her country. She had done nothing. She was just an old woman who owned guns and made a foolish statement. Thank you. Rosemary, thank you so much for that. I have to say, uh, I started right out of the gate with that, obviously, in your collection, and it made me think so much of Twilight Zone episodes. Um, oh. That wonderful, like, 
I don't know, a, a kind of inky feeling that makes you feel a little insecure. And I, I loved that story to start thank off the collection. So thank you so much for sharing. And once again, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Our last reader, our last author, excuse me, though, also a reader, and uh, of course, certainly not least, is Mary Troy, who uh, the collection featured tonight is Joe Baker is Dead. Mary grew up in Florissant, Missouri, or North County, St. Louis, and while I won't reveal her age, she told me that she remembers when it was just a small farming community that changed as she grew with subdivisions growing and popping up overnight. She never, she said she never thought she was smart enough to write and came to the field a little later than most of her peers. Uh, as many of us do, she decided she was done with Missouri. She was leaving and she vowed never to return. But after some stints in Hawaii and Arkansas, she ended up back near her old stomping ground. She's now in Ferguson uh, teaching at UMSL. She was actually the first director of the UMSL MFA program. She did that for 13 years and she says she's proud to say that their grads have published 60 to 70 books so far and that Ron Austin, who's featured tonight, is one of their stars. She says she's come across authors during other panels across the country who are just shocked to hear that there's a literary world uh, here in Missouri. And she says she's always tempted to say, quote, I don't want to ask them if they've ever heard of Mark Twain by any chance. So Mary will now be reading uh, to us from her actually her latest novel, Swimming on Highway N, which begins in the top tier of the Ozark in Bourbon, Missouri, which I actually know well. It's where my parents met uh, in their first teaching jobs. And I was joking with Mary that every time I drive through Bourbon on I-44, I give it a little salute and, and thank, you, thank it for my existence. So Mary, please take us away. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And you, you frightened me for a minute. I thought you wanted me to read from Joe Baker and I was going to go back to my bookcase and get it. But I will read some, a little bit from um, Swimming on Highway End. And so I'm going to read like four paragraphs from the first five pages, but I don't think they need any explanation. I'll start at the very beginning. Flesh on a hillside, a body barely covered in water. An old body, Louise's ghost said, and Madeline agreed. Sixty was old. Still, she spent her days in a bikini, soaking in tepid water in a child-sized pool in full view of Highway N. Not aging gracefully, Louise's ghost said, and Madeline agreed with that, too. Her pool reminded her of the one Chris, Louise's son and Madeline's first husband, had back when they were both in second or third grade, three blue rings and a flexible plastic bottom. She bought hers in April and spent hours puffing and blowing to make the rings full and bouncy. Then she searched for and found the faded red bikini in an unopened moving box marked miscellaneous. The bikini was a concession. She wanted to be bare, wanted her meat and bones blending with the dirt of the Ozarks. She joked with herself this could be a long-delayed adolescent rebellion, a way of not following Louise in all. That she was 60 and Louise had been dead for eight years made it an easier rebellion, to be sure. She smiled in the early morning heat and haze. Here she was, swimming on Highway N, making herself an object, a thing to notice if driving up above. As you approach downtown Bourbon, look to your right and down the hill and see the old woman in the red bikini, the old woman with three dead husbands and an estranged daughter, the unruined woman. She'd not been ruined. Her first mother had not ruined her. She knew it as she sprawled on her hillside in early September 2005. From her pool on Highway End, she looked to her past trying to shape the life of Madeline Dames into a story with the theme and forward movement, even with the last scenes unwritten. An air horn blasted from a semi speeding along Highway N, 60 or so feet above her pool. She waved. It was that kid from Sullivan who now drove for Snyder. She sipped from her plastic tumbler of Chablis, taken over ice on days like this, when the air temperature topped 90. Ollie's daughter called her foolish for moving to the sticks, so far from her previous life, 15 years in the heart of Chicago. 
Ali was her third dead husband, but repetition didn't make the loss easier, or so she told herself. Even as she worried his loss, all the losses may have been too easy to bear. How sad was sad enough. It wasn't the question she wanted answered anyway, and the hell was introspection. She'd loved all her husbands in her own way. How else but that? Did it matter by now, all of it finished? The sticks, she told Ollie's daughter and others. She wanted the sticks. She wanted to start out as a stranger in some backwards place and see how long before she was one of them. Sometimes when she said it like that, she believed herself. That's it for me. Mary, thank you so much. Um, I'm so excited to be talking with the three of you this evening. I uh, loved every collection uh, for very, very different reasons. And so I'm going to start us off tonight. Actually, before we dive into the collections um, that were listed, you know, I was wondering if you guys could just tell me about one of your first um, or early favorite memories of storytelling. You know, mine really poetry. I was raised by teachers who really believed very strongly in storytelling and the history of like oral tradition. And so I remember my first poem, but it's nonsensical. I, I won't make people listen to it. But I'm wondering uh, for yourself, what's that first early memory for you of the strength and power of storytelling? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, um, was always the person in the family, the child in the family who didn't sleep when the others went to sleep. So that meant I got to hear my parents tell stories. That means that when we would go on car rides, I would be awake in the back seat and listen to what they said. And I would hide on my grandmother's porch when all the adults were sitting around telling stories after dinner at her house. Um, and so I, I became fascinated with it's some of the same stories told over and over, um, sometimes with slightly different endings or beginnings. And, um, but later on, I just became a reader. I was, I was an avid reader from an early age. And then when I got into high school, it was like, I memorized Edna St. Vincent Millay poems. And, oh, and music, one of my favorites. I can, you know, some of them I can still say, E.E. E. Cummings then, you know, knocked me over and, um, I mean, there have been so many books that I've read that have just like knocked the top of my head off. And I thought, wow, you know, to be able to do that. So so I guess it's really just a continuation for me. Wonderful. Ron, would you like to go next? Oh, uh, sure. Um, my very earliest memory. Um, well, I probably would say that, uh, you know, so story telling could pemism for lying. So I think that a lot of the best storytelling, when you really think about it, you're probably making up stories when you're a very young kid to get out of or into situations. Um, but beyond that, when I started committing uh, some of the storytelling to paper, I think it was maybe first or second grade that I would make comic books. So I'd make kind of, they'd be a mix between a comic book and a Where's Waldo. So I'd make like a whole like, let's say an underwater seascape and then there'd be some kind of adventure going on there. And I very often do that instead of doing my homework. Um, so I don't think I was a, a teacher's favorite for a very long time, um, but those are some of my earliest memories. And I still really like telling stories. Um, my four-year-old son, he's a bit of a storyteller himself. So, you know, the tradition is long living and alive. <laughs> That's awesome. And your son at four is really uh, coming up in the resurgence of zines. So maybe you, uh, you know, brush off some of those early comic book skills and get him into, you know, writing his, his very first magazine of comics. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ron. So Rosemarie, how about yourself? Well, I think probably it started with, uh, with songs and ballads more than it did reading because I remember they poor babes in the woods and and that kind of song of uh, uh what will the little joe do in the fall or these these kinds of songs but also my mother uh, would buy used books we lived in a real small town and she worked in a factory but when people would have uh, sales you know like uh oh, when someone dies and they have the estate sales she would pick up boxes of books and she would read stories from those to us, but usually they were really sad, short tales. Things like a little girl that had a needle 
for a doll. I mean, that, that's one I remember. Uh, things that made you cry. And um, so I started writing songs, uh, ballads and prayers, and then little stories about fairies and things like that. And gradually I, I got involved in suspense and romance. And I think that that's what it all started with. It started with songs and then ballads and then, then into writing. And when I learned about structure, structure, I think for a while I lost my storytelling ability because I was too, too concerned about form and proper language. And it took me a while to grasp it all back. Yeah, I feel like that's something we're hearing discussed a lot these days is how art doesn't have to necessarily be good to be done, right? You should always create and create recklessly. Well, and, 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 and Personally, I believe that the person's natural voice is the best storytelling voice and wow. that they should keep it. So. Yeah, and I definitely see that reflected in the radio work that I do, especially with my young students, you know, telling them to, to make their stories sound like themselves to really stay true to that voice that they have. Um, from the very beginning. Well, wonderful. So tonight we're here to discuss Missouri and how it's impacted the way that you guys write, the stories that you write, the settings that you write from. And so, you know, Missouri is a place that formed us and a place that informs your writing. And I definitely did feel very connected, like I mentioned earlier, when I could identify street names, um, you know, or places like Soulard's Farmer's Market or a description or like a feeling or, um, you know, the moment where, they're driving through rural Missouri talking about how people who live in rural Missouri don't leave lights on at night. Like these are things that I connected with deeply. And so I'm curious, you know, how have the places that you were born and raised impacted your writing, whether that's the Boot Heel or St. Louis? And, you know, why did you choose to stay in those settings as opposed to, you know, going into something more like science fiction or fantasy um, or even, you know, more exotic locales? Mary, do yeah. you want to come again? Sorry, Rosemary. Yeah, I was just going to jump in since no one had. <laughs> I, think, um, I think I love the boot heel, and I've always wanted to write about Southeast Missouri. And out of three collections and 45 stories in those collections, 36 of them are set in the boot heel. And yet, I have been told by uh, that the landscape isn't very important in my writing. And I realized that the characters are more important. And so even though I love the boot heel, that's my setting, that's my language, that's my history, everything, that landscape is, does not become a character in my work. I'm not, it's not strong that way. And instead, the Missouri sensibilities and everything travel with me. So I write characters from other places, but usually, some of them are from Missouri, or they go back to Missouri, because uh, I see my, my past and my upbringing, even though it was quite poor and in a very small town, I see it as sort of mythical and wonderful. And I think most people tend to do that with their past and their childhood. They draw out what was good about it and cling to it. I think that's true of most people. So Missouri is just in me. Yeah. It sunk those hooks deep. I feel that in myself as well. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose, you know, Missouri is in me too. It's although I don't write stories set in Missouri out of a deep abiding love. I can't like Rosemary <laughs> claim to love the boot heel or to love any part of Missouri. It's, it's a, it's a very annoying place to live in a whole lot of ways. Um, <laughs> but but it is, it is also one of the most beautiful states. Mm -hmm. And um, when you travel around a lot, you, you come to realize that there's hardly anything better than the Ozark hardwood for forest. In fact, it's one of the few hardwood forests left. Um, and, and the lakes and the rivers, it, um, the hills, it's, it's just beautiful. And yet, and yet, um, when my husband and I take the back roads, as we tend to do on our drives, we, you know, we see like the mist rising from the river in the morning. We, we come across, come around a corner and there's the wheat field and, and you think, my God. And then, you know, it's just not five minutes later when you see some horrible, nasty billboard, you know, claiming that, you know, everything is Obama's fault or whatever, you know, whatever they want to say. And you think, how in the world can people who live with this beauty 
be so mean. And then you go into a small town and the only thing there in some of them, you know, you have a Dollar General and you have two Quonset hot churches and that's it. Sometimes if you're lucky, a gas station. So you say, well, no wonder they're, they're mean, you know, but, but I mean, you know, that's, that's not entire, you know, there are a lot of nice Missouri places too, but, but there's this, there's this push pull. And when I left St. Louis, I said, well, I'm not coming back. Um, and it wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't just out of boredom. It was partly out of boredom, but it was, it was mostly just that there was so much that, that hadn't, that hadn't made sense in Missouri, in St. Louis. And, um, you know, and part of it is, is really just the, the racial segregation and how tired you get of people saying, oh, well, is that still a good neighborhood? Even just like coded little phrases like that. And, and um, you know, but I did come back and I realized it's not unique that there are a whole lot of places like that all across the country. Um, so, so I don't write Missouri out of love, but I write it because it's where I am. And, and you have to, everything has to happen somewhere. And Missouri's got a lot going on in, in many ways, good and bad. Yeah. Ron, how about yourself? So, um, so working from there, uh, it's really interesting the different things that keeps a writer going. It's a special kind of brew and alchemy. It's different for everybody else. And one way I tap into motivation is to work for something that's bigger than myself. And for there is Mary was talking about some things that don't make sense about Missouri, don't make sense about St. Louis. My writing right now and has been for a long time an investigation of a place that I love. So specifically coming from St. Louis City and seeing parts of where I grew up just literally disappear, just collapse um, from neglect generally and seeing the after effects of segregation and redlining and all these really troublesome things. Um, I write as a way to understand and also document as I know that I have a perspective that's underrepresented um, in literature at large and especially in the consideration of a Midwestern voice. Um, some recent books that are pretty interesting that I'm glad to see come out of St. Louis or come from St. Louis writers are uh, like this uh, nonfiction memoir, The Last Children of Mill Creek by Vivian Gibson. She actually writes about a St. Louis neighborhood that disappeared um, and she right. documents it. And I feel like whenever I go back to my home neighborhood, I'm watching it slowly disappear in the same way. And it's very heartbreaking and surreal. And I'm trying to just ask why, and you know, how do we get here? Um, another book, I don't have it, I don't have a copy of it here, um, but a book by Lindsay Ellis called Bone Broth um, charts the um, St. Louis activism. And so I think it's really interesting when you consider the Midwest voice and also where it is as far as on the map of American literature, it deserves a place. With that being said, part of the growth and the forward movement for Midwestern literature is really getting into all the richness that's there and all the diverse stories uh, that are possible. Wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and just take two seconds to apologize if my cat decides to butt in while this is happening. He is a little needy, so he's been meowing and like nipping at my feet. So I just want to apologize up front. Um, but Ron, I love the way that you put that. And you know, I, I really connected with your collection because I think it is such um, a wonderful, like complex view of something that often does get just, you know, distilled down to that phrase, is that still a good neighborhood? And you know, even through my work in journalism, um, a lot of what I've been doing lately uh, is it, it communicating with people who were uh, to life a uh, juvenile life without parole. And one of them that I've, I've been working quite a bit with and who I've communicated with for a long time has written books of his own talking about what it was like growing up in St. Louis City without opportunities and the ways that you have to turn to things to survive. And I, I loved that so much of that was here in Avery's story as well. Um, there's one particular part where he's talking to Keith, um, who was making crack. Um, and trying to like convince Avery at a moment to become a, a dealer for him, you know, take up the mantle that his, his uncle um, had had at one point. 
And he said, you know, what do you see when you look in this pan? I see, you know, like, uh, you know, I see chicks, I see a house payment, I see new suits. And like really, you know, breaks down just this idea of someone as a, a black and white option and, and really colors them in these shades of gray. Uh, and, and so, you know, we, we talk about Missouri as a place that deserves to be viewed as a complex place. And I, I think, you know, I, I talked about this a little bit with you guys in correspondence before tonight, but I, I feel like we've started to move towards Missouri as just the synonym for, you know, dark, seedy, and dangerous. Whether that's Ozark, the TV show, um, whether that's Gone Girl, Jillian Flynn's book, or even um, Daniel Woodrow's book, uh, Winter Zone, right? Or even just St. Louis being, you know, murder capital, and that's all you hear about with St. Louis. And so I guess, you know, why was it so important to you, just really doubling back down on this, to show the complexity of Missouri as a place and the complexity of the people that make up those communities that really are, you know, the, the ground rock, the foundation of a community of Missouri. Um, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in here. I, uh, it, it makes me think specifically with that story and some other ones in the collection, it takes me back to workshopping. Um, which I did want to specifically say to Mary, I'm really excited to be here. I wouldn't <laughs> be here without you. Um, so anytime I can say thanks, I need to take that opportunity. But I remember my first workshop story, I think um, a version of it, that's actually, that was the first story I ever did in graduate school workshopping was a version of Cauldron. And I remember getting the feedback from it being kind of mixed. And one of the comments was somebody was like, well, you know, obviously this is a rip off of The Wire or something like that. And at that point, I had never seen The Wire before. I was like, this is my, like, <laughs> this is my home. <laughs> I'm trying to understand and investigate some things here. And so I think that's a pretty common, um, I, I think there are just a lot of misperceptions and misrepresentations in some ways. And part of pursuing writing, especially fiction writing, is trying to find an emotional truth, philosophical truth by telling lies. So I felt responsible to be honest about certain situations, but I also needed to make sure that there was that human complexity, that people could see, you know, just what are the, some of the pressures that someone faces and why people make, um, why people make particular choices just because it makes sense at the time. I was trying to get to the root of that um, and especially being conscious of that not everybody would necessarily see how you could get into that situation. Um, so it, it's for me, writing is a lot about exploration, investigation. I don't really, I mean, I like, when I write, I entertain myself. If other people <laughs> get entertained, that's great. Um, and, you know, so I don't have anything outside of just like, I want to feel something when I'm putting it on the page. And if I can feel something um, and there's some kind of, elucidation or I figure something out, maybe somebody else will too. I love that. And I also think it's so fast. I'm sorry, Mary. I was just going to say, Ron, I think it's so fascinating that you use that word investigation because I feel like, you know, almost interestingly enough, you're trying to accomplish similar things in your short story writing as I'm trying to do with journalism, right? Break down those misconceptions, introduce people to characters, whether it's Avery in your short story who's our narrator, or whether it's someone that I'm interviewing. I think that's fascinating that there's those very similar things working on both the nonfiction and fiction side. Mary, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt uh, you. Well, I was I was gonna say um, the idea of, you know, that you have what everybody else thinks is going on, and then and then you have what you think is going on. And and we all see things from our our own perspective. We filter them through our own consciousness. So um, sometimes I think fiction writing is kind of like um, Emily Dickinson's advice to tell all the truth, but tell it slant. And the slant is the perspective, the, per, the perception you bring to it, but it's, you know, and that's something that is just there that you don't create or pretend. But the other part is you, you like try to, to present it in a new way and you try to make it different. And I think that, um, yeah, okay, so you talk about Ozark and you talk about, you know, the TV show Ozark and, you know, what that said about the Ozarks. It was, it was good TV. And yet <laughs> I'm sure it was, you know, it's very, very far from the truth, the truth that I know. And so we all know a different truth is, is the point. And so just one or two versions 
don't have to then come to represent the whole so that everybody just thinks of those few things. Yeah. Well, I'll weigh in here, which is, it, this allows me to discuss about one of the things I value in, uh, in fiction, and obviously it's in Ron's and Mary's too, and that is not to be afraid to show the ugly side of human nature as long as you're responsible enough to show that it is ugly and that there's, there's, there's a moral point in the story. One of my difficulties in writing in fiction is that sometimes my characters aren't very likable because I'm writing about real people. And, but often I want to show what causes that kind of behavior. It's not that you can forgive them, but you can understand it sometimes. Yeah. And to allow people to see how many major battles are fought in the small scale world. Uh, that take great courage, great fortitude, and sometimes you're going to fail. Uh, often you're going to fail. One of the things, is it all right to discuss that others were, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. I'm not going to. I've only read one of Ron's stories uh, because I just got the collection yesterday and I had to wipe it off with because I'm afraid of the virus. But I read the first story and I loved it. And the grandfather is so mean, but he is so understandable. And uh, the young boy, uh, his view of the world is so beautiful that even in spite of what he sees that is cruel or death of a possum, he's still got this beautiful vision. He says sometime, one place there's something like, uh, like the butter, the sunshine was like butter between two fingers or something like that. I thought, oh my God, why can't I do this? And Mary, if you've ever read Highway Inn, she takes characters that you think, I hate this person. I would give her up as a mother too. <laughs> then, then you encounter a moment of insight into what this woman is like, what she endured, and you have to feel compassion. And so that's what all of us, I think, are trying to do with our writing, is to be honest, make people be compassionate, but point out that's mean. Don't put up with it, you know. Because, I mean, I can't really think of, I mean, any character in, in any of your collections that is truly, you know, tr just good or bad, or, you know, Jedi or Stormtrooper, right? They're all some sort of mixture of that. And mm -hmm. so I'm curious, you know, was that a conscious decision on your guys' part to leave that decision-making, that judgment up to the readers? Or was it even almost a reflection of, asking the readers why they judge. Well, for me, I wanted to jump in here and I wanted to say something kind of surprising. Um, there are particular ways in which I'm kind of a mean, <laughs> unkind person. It's just that I'm honest with myself in those particular ways. And maybe if people don't notice it, I'm doing a good job of managing that. And I think that's the best anybody can do. That's just the truth of people. I think when you have that moralistic compass, um, sometimes they're from the standpoint of uh, comeuppance and storytelling. That if you, like a lot of people are, are satisfied if you introduce a character and they're clearly a bad guy and they do something bad, but later on they come to justice, so on and so forth. Um, that, I mean, that doesn't often happen. You know, a lot of bad people get away with bad stuff for a long time. Um, a lot of good people, you know, find them in those and strange situations. So I, I think that's kind of just like good realism, the following mm -hmm. that literary tradition of realism, you know, from whoever you look to as far as maintaining that tradition, it's just the medical life. And like you, when you kind of look around and you see the situations that everyone's in and their mindset and approaching it, you know, I, I think most people wake up with good faith and good intentions and as Rosemary was saying, you get challenged every day and you want to try to hold on to that good faith and good intentions. Um, but sometimes you fail. Sometimes you make mistakes. Uh, sometimes other people make mistakes. Sometimes things get really muddy and life is messy. And that's what makes it exciting. And trying to clearly put that messiness on the page uh, is, I mean, it's a whole lot of fun, really. I love that. And I, I just want to mention, it looks like we, oh, we got Mary back. Never mind. Yeah, I, I, I got off for some reason. I don't even know why. <laughs> but Ron, I think that's 
I, I, yeah, I mean, how often do we get that clear delineation? And I, I, I hope the giggle earlier was about Jedi or Stormtrooper. Um, I, I very much, just as a side note, identified with Avery's nerdiness, and it sounds like your own love of comics. And I just have to show you that uh, there's quite a bit of talk in the book about Avery, our character, reading Conan uh, books and comics. And I was reminded last night by my dad that I, in fact, have an early Conan comic. So I went back last night after, uh, after uh, you know, revisiting and taking a couple more notes in the book and read through that <laughs> as a way to further connect with, with Avery. Um, but so, yeah, I'm sorry again to interject, but Rosemary Mary, do you have any um, reflections on this question about whether or not this is a, you know, a conscious decision as a writer to leave that up to your reader to make those judgments or asking them whether or not judgment makes sense? No, I think that's what you want to do. You, um, if, if the writer has done a, a good job, the reader makes the judgment. Mm. Um, the, and, and, and you can't control what, you know, people, no two uh, readers read the same story or the same book. And so some readers will judge the character one way, maybe not the way you meant that person to be judged, mm -hmm. but you have created, you have created a, uh, a reality. You've put this character in a place and you've had her say things and do things and react. And then other people will, will judge. You want them to judge. But also, um, like there are novels I've read that I, I judge the character different ways every time. For instance, Catcher in the Rye. When I read that story when I was 14, I thought Holden was just the best person, the smartest person. <laughs> But, you know, it was me. When I read it again when I was in my 30s, I thought, oh, I see Salinger making kind of fun of this kid, you know. And then when I read it again, when I was in my 60s, I once again fell in love with Holden in a way that I had when I was young. But, you, I mean, you keep judging the characters in different ways, depending on, on where you are at the time. And it's not up to Salinger to judge him. It's just up to Salinger to give us Holden Caulfield. That. Rosemary? Well, I'm, I don't know if I'm total in agreement with everyone because sometimes I think when you're handling a certain subject, you are guiding the reader toward a judgment that you hope that they make, you want them to make. And that's one reason why I don't handle certain subjects that I wish my talent would uh, allow me to handle or my perspective or my experience. I don't know enough about to handle certain topics because I don't want to, I don't want to lead the reader the wrong way. And so if my ability isn't gonna let me handle it well, I don't deal with it. So <laughs> I imagine we're probably all on the same page when it, you know, I don't write, if, I don't write about anything that I'm not, can't be open-minded about or learn something from myself. I'm not, I'm not an expository writer. I'm not a preacher. I'm exploring human nature but sometimes if something's reprehensible, it's my responsible as a writer to present it as reprehensible, period. That's how I feel. Yeah. Well, so we're getting on in the, the conversation enough that we should hopefully be getting some questions from our audience. So please, if you're watching along, listening in, uh, please do start submitting your questions now. We'll get to those in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I want to just ask you guys a couple questions about process, about writing something like a short story collection. Um, you know, one thing I thought that was really interesting about this selection of collections Ooh, that's a phrase, um, is that each of you chose something very different as a through line. You know, Ron, in your in your collection, you chose a single narrator. Uh, Mary, in yours, you chose a dead guy, uh, who's kind of our, our, our needle that weaves everything together. And I have to let you know, I listened to George Jones's He Stopped Loving Her Today when I started the collection, because it just felt right. Uh, and then, you know, Rosemary, you picked kind of this force, whether that's the non-commonness, for lack of a better term, of people or, you know, a threat of violence. And so I'm wondering, when you guys are sitting down to write, do you write disconnected short stories and then find a through line? Or do you come to the page with a through line and then create the stories to build that narrative? Well, I'll go first this time. My stories never come to me in an order. They come to me by the character or the subject and what I can write at the time. And so my collections shape themselves over time 
And I really admire people who can take an air, a town or an area or part of their life or history and write about it. I can't. They come up individually and then they gradually group themselves. It's unfortunate. It's not the best organized way to do, but it has served me well. So the chaotic nature of creativity, perhaps. <laughs> sort of. Well, I do it every day, though, I give it a chance to be orderly. Well, I'll, I'll say that, um, um, Becky, you're talking about Joe Baker is dead and my first book. And I, um, I didn't intend that to be connected stories until I was about halfway through. Yeah. And it occurred to me that I had mentioned this character once or twice and I could um, put him in, in other. And so then the, the next five stories I wrote, it was in the same area. It's also the same geographic area and um, of South City in the um, late 80s, early 90s. Mm. Um, the next two collections were only, they weren't connected at all. Um, the Alibi Cafe, except for being in Missouri and the um, Cookie Lily just in Hawaii. And then novels are different. Right now, I'm trying to write a, a, a collection that I see almost as a tapestry. There's a common character mentioned in all of them, but all the other characters are also connected to each other in strange ways that keep surprising me. It's kind of like weaving or something because yeah. of the framework for the stories and I'm, and I'm working through it. And I don't know why I'm doing that exactly, except I like it. I mean, I don't know that <laughs> anybody wants to read things like that, but, um, but it's, yeah, the process is different, I think, for every book. Well, and I think weaving a straight line or weaving a, a web is a little bit more difficult than drawing a straight line. So it's got to be a lot more work for you as well. <laughs> yeah, it is. It <laughs> and then Ron, how about yourself? Uh, I'll jump in and say that I really love the short story form. And specifically, I feel like the connected short story collection is really kind of underutilized. Um, so right now I do make a conscious effort to find that three line just so that I can connect it in an interesting way. So along with that, I think about like poetry collections or even concept albums. So that's the way I approach a collection. And I like the kind of cumulative effect that you can create. Um, so the project I'm working on now, um, it's in the same area with uh, a one of like a same central element, but the characters are doing a lot of different things. So a lot of it is just kind of like, you know, kind of improving and riffing off of an idea and seeing what shows up and going from there. Wonderful. Well, I want to make sure we get to these audience questions. So I'm going to ask our, our first one, which is from uh, Marsha Lake. What prompts you to write a story, a person that you met, a place that you visited, a conversation you've overheard, something you've experienced? It's, it's usually all of those. It, it can be any of those. Sometimes it's just the look on someone's face um, that makes you wonder what has what what is her life like or what what is he going home to and um, and and stories can begin there and sometimes it's a memory too. It reminds me so much of one of your characters that actually um, writes erotica based off of short interactions that she overhears. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I agree with Mary. My stories are, are usually character stories, but also I'll see a situation and I will wonder how it would play out or what caused it. And and almost all of my writing is, is, is exploring. Only a few stories have I explored deliberately from point of view to see how something could be seen from a multiple points of view, because I like I like that form very much. But all of those things prompt stories for me. Yeah. I, I would agree with everything that's being said. And I also really believe in the power of daydreaming. Uh, so sometimes just a really wild idea will come up to me or even look, like the difficulty of like understanding or unpacking a particular situation. So a lot of writing is exploration, investigation, but also a challenge of like, can I render this on the page in a way that makes sense? And sometimes I'll just end up with a batch of interesting phrases, but that's still fun. <laughs> Yeah. So next we have a question from YouTube. Lots of people say Missouri has an identity problem. Not quite Southern, not quite Northern. 
How does community identity play out in your stories? Well, community is one of my biggest things. So I'll answer that because I think it's one of the most important parts of, of social man is community. So I write a lot from the community voice so that the story will have one main character, perhaps, or one central plot, but you will get the community feeling about that. And I love that kind of thing in writing where the community becomes the defender of what's right. Now, when they're the defender of what's wrong, it's terrible. I don't remember which story it was, but one of uh, Zora Neale Hurston's stories was about mistreatment of a woman by a husband. She was being beaten. And one of the one of the members of the community talked to him. The whole community sort of tried to, to write that. And in Faulkner's work, a guy's getting ready to, to spank a little boy too hard because he thinks the boy hasn't obeyed him. And someone comes up from the community. It's very... Just one line, this guy comes up and says, will you do that? If you're going to do that, you're going to have to whip every one of us. And it doesn't identify who the man is or anything, but it means the whole community says, don't whip that kid. That's how I take it. And so I think community in writing is really important. Yeah. Ron, Mary, anything to add? Uh, no, um, I, I, I mean, I, I think, yes, community community is, is very important. The state identity, you know, I mean, what's, what's the state, the, the boundaries, whether it's north or south, as, as the question says, nobody really knows or agrees with. And, and, um, but it's, it's like the, the individual community. Sometimes community is really just the family. Right. 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 Yeah. So this is actually, oh, I'm sorry, Ron, please go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to jump in that um, considering the identity of the, the sort of uh, the literary identity of where you're writing from is important, but I also think it's important just to write the best things that you can. And if you write something that's strong and something that's honest and unique, folks will start to take notice. And naturally, if you're writing about your area, people will start to you know, connect some dots and see some shades of it. So I think it's kind of a, a question that you'd have to approach from two minds that I think it is something to be invested in the um, identity of your writing community and where you're writing from, but also you kind of have to be able to let that go in order to just focus on the work itself. Yeah. So this next one, Mary, actually comes from a part of your introduction when you said you had this experience at another book festival on the coast, people from Boston and New York are like, Missouri, there's literature there. And so you know, we do have this really rich history with Mark Twain and others. Um, and, and so you know, what kind of reaction do you get from other people in, in the writer world and the publishing world when you say, I'm from Missouri? <laughs> Well, in, in fact, in the writer world and the publishing world, most people are, are pretty wise and well-read. And so they, they don't have that, they don't necessarily have that. But this really did surprise me because I was, it was an East Coast thing. It was all, it was at Lehigh University and all these people, um, you know, from New York. And one of them had worked on the, the TV show 2020 and, and, you know, I mean, and, Anyway, they were kind of high-powered sort of Easterners, and I thought, well, if anybody knows anything, they would. And and we were talking about our books and about our students and the MFA program. I mentioned our <laughs> literary journal that we had. And afterwards, they all came up to me like, like they were trying to make me feel good. They were complimenting me and saying, we were so impressed. Imagine all that literary stuff going on in Missouri, and I just – you know, I mean, I was I was nice and I said, oh, you know, sure, you know, but I was tempted to say, have you ever heard of Mark Twain or else maybe I was, you know, more like to say, well, yeah, usually, you know, when we can find our shoes and get going, we can, you know, scribble something now and then. And, and <laughs> but it's uh, I don't know. I mean, there is still some of that that goes on this, you know, oh, Missouri, what can you offer? And um I don't know. I don't know what we can offer, but I think as much as anybody. How about Ron, Rosemary? Do you get weird reactions or what kind of reaction do you get when you let people know that you're from Missouri? 
Well, I mean, mostly people are, I, I think maybe, maybe naturally or instinctually, I tend to gravitate toward maybe those wise people that Mary is describing. Um, I, I don't know if I just naturally like veer away from anything that's a little bit <laughs> strange or dismissive. Um, and I'm still kind of in the point to where I'm just trying to find people who connect with the similar conversations um, that I'm trying to have and I'm trying to engage with them. And some of the conversations that I'm having, especially the African-American experience, you have folks from all over the country. Um, so the other elements is to think about different ways that you connect to different writers and writing communities and those intersections can be really interesting so i mean um yeah i mean i don't know and i'm still honestly in the place that if someone if a stranger says they read something i wrote i'm still like wow why did you do that do you have a lot of time on your hands so you know i just <laughs> stick to the page and see what happens <laughs> Well, I've, I've always felt like being a writer from Missouri meant that I would be sort of treated as scans, like I was from the backwoods and I didn't know what I was doing. That hasn't been what I've experienced. And uh, I've, I've met writers just in local communities that haven't published well, that are some of the best writers I've run into. And I know it's a matter of luck, sometimes who you know, networking, everything. We have so many good writers here. And then there are Missouri writers that I admire in different ways, like, uh, is it Paulette Giles who wrote News of the World? I love that News of the World. I'd give anything if I could write a book like that. And then Howard Marshall is a folklorist here in Tucson, and he writes about the fiddle tradition. And of course, we've got Mark Twain, you know, and who was that woman that wrote The Moonflower years ago? I, I don't shoot. It wasn't the best book in the world, but when I stepped into that book, I thought, oh, well, this woman is Missouri. I know that. And I don't know if John Mort is from Missouri or from the Ozarks, but I mean, we have a lot of good writers now from Missouri, and uh, Mary Troy is one of them, and then there's Rudy Lewis and uh, a lot of people. And I know a woman who was writing a book about Missouri, uh, about Missouri, and a New York agent wrote her and asked her, to write another story set in Missouri. Missouri is sort of, you know, maybe we're like the primities coming into the modern world and they want to hear from us, watch us grow up and grow out of it, you know, so. Yeah. Well, you know, kind of related to that, Rosemary, somebody in the audience was asking if you have uh, favorite authors that you can name and bonus points if they're from Missouri. Hmm. Well, Paulette Giles, I just named her. I love Paulette Giles. Of course, we all love Mark Twain, Kate Chopin, although she moved, yeah. she, moved to the, she moved to the South. I'm not a Heinlein fan, but there you go. Uh, uh, Sci-fi fantasy is very much up my alley. Maya Angelou is a, is a Missouri, oh. St. Louisan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, many, many, uh, you know, uh, Tennessee Williams and, and people like that, T.S. Eliot. But I think, um, I, I also like Paulette Jass. Did she do Enemy Women? She did that too. She did Enemy Women, but the one that I read and loved. Yeah, it was News from the World, yeah. I yeah. just bought a copy of Enemy Women, so it is sitting on a stack waiting to be read. Mm -hmm. Ron, how about yourself? Some favorite authors? Um, so I've been reading more poetry lately than anything, uh, but I'll talk Top of my head, uh, Jasmine Ward, Toni Morrison, Maya, Maya Angelou. Um, for poetry, I uh, really like Natalie Diaz. Um, and then, uh, oh, well, of course, Jericho Brown. I was teaching some of his poetry for a class earlier this week. And so I am, um, yeah, I mean, there's just, there's just so much good writing everywhere. Um, and I, you know, I appreciate everything that's going on in the current literary traditions. I hear, Ron, you're also into graphic uh, some and maybe writing some of your own graphic. And so do you have a favorite author in comics and graphic right now? Um, one book that I'm reading right now that I really enjoy is uh, My Favorite Thing is Monsters. And oh, it's, yeah. it's so good and it's so expressive that, I, I mean, I could have finished it a while ago, but uh, like each page is like, it's so well done because it's style morphs depending upon what the character's thinking about and what she's uh, exploring. So I just like, I'll pick it up and then I'll read like 20 pages and then I'll set it down and I'll think about it. 
And then like a few months later, I'll read 20 more pages because it's, it's just so good. <laughs> And I think the art can sometimes make it a little bit more overwhelming and, and enveloping at times. Uh, so moving on just real quick, you know, a great question from our audience is, what's your advice for finding great writing or reading communities in Missouri? Well, I belong to a number of them, so I don't know how I found them, though. <laughs> I'm trying to remember how I found them. But one of the things is that uh, you go where there are going to be writers. You go to readings. You you listen to read. Now then you go to Zoom readings and you write down names and where they are. And uh, I hate to admit it, but one way to find the writing community right now is go to Twitter. I'm not a Twitter person and I don't tweet well, but by golly, they are communities. And they write to each other about where can I send this? I'm writing this. They build. And, and they and they tell you where you can go read. So that's open to people now. But I found it by being in a small town and mixing with, with writers. And I would agree with that. Um, the, there are a lot of places that are putting on really good readings. I'm really grateful for the way that everything pivoted with the pandemic and we have all these Zoom events. And yep. there's a whole lot of access um, to things that you normally wouldn't have access to. So that's really great. And I would say if you volunteer to read a slush pile, um, I cannot praise folks who are literary journal editors because they really keep all this going and, you know, they just do not get enough recognition. So if you want to find a way into a reading community and see what out, what's out there, just volunteer to read a slush pile. I think everybody should spend some time working for a literary journal so that they kind of get a feel for things. Um, but you know, there, there are just so many great people who are putting their passion um, into being able to cre create these platforms that we all need and that we all thrive from. I agree. I agree with that. Uh, I agree, especially, I don't know about Twitter. I'll have to check that out. But I agree, especially with the literary journals. I, You know, and you don't even have to live in town. You don't have to be connected. Um, you, they'll send you work um, and and suddenly you're commenting and you're commenting and other people comment on your comments and and uh, it really is it really is a terrific way to start mm -hmm. another question we have and this one comes from takia thomas she says imagine you're the head writer for a tv show based in missouri one where does it take place and two what or who would be the primary focus would you repeat that, Becky? Of course, of course. This uh, uh, listener, Tiki Thomas, said, imagine you're the head writer for a new TV show. It's based in Missouri. One, where in Missouri would it take place? And two, what or who would be the focus of that show? <laughs> How much time do we have left? <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to give this some deep thought. And do we want it to be a hit? I mean, uh, are we concerned about that? <laughs> I don't know. This really is. Uh, I'll bet Ron can answer it. I know it wouldn't um, be in the suburbs. I'm working on high concept stuff, so all my ideas are really bizarre. Uh, so that's to say <laughs> that the story I'm grabbing right now. It's about if Bush Stadium got bought out by this like, like magical corporation and then they have these giants, these rest giants and then it's like they have these coliseum style Ooh. games uh, so, so that's the current challenge i've given myself is how do i make this story sensible and that's probably something that you know has tv curb appeal <laughs> so, so are, the giant, are the giant battles is that going to be called like the rams just an homage to you know the football team that's gone <laughs> I've, tried few, I've tried a few different times so like they're in I, so, like so far i have a cardinals reference um I think I have a pretty good through line because the hard thing is like, I like to approach high concept from like, here's a really strange concept. And then I do something completely different. And then every yeah. once in a while I'll be like, oh yeah, there's this strange concept we started with. 
So I know we're getting close to wrapping up, but I want to sneak in just one last question for folks. And it actually was inspired by an email conversation that you and I had, Mary, how you said you never thought you were smart enough for writing and that you came to this a little later than, you know, people who knew from infancy that they were born to be one. And so, you know, what are, are your words of encouragement or advice to people who are just starting out or they're, they're trepidatious about picking up the pen for the first time? Uh, you know, I, I mean, what is your word, your, your words of encouragement? encouragement to them, uh, as, as, you know, when it comes to writing short story, when it comes to writing anything? Well, first of all, um, you have to do it. You just have to do it. Um, if, if you think you want to do it, then you have to do it. And if you never get around to it or you don't have time or you have too many things getting in the way, then it means you really didn't want to do it. Um, and I, and you, you don't judge yourself all the time you write <laughs> and you get better and you enjoy it. And you have to finally love writing, not just having written something, but you have to love doing it. And, and I also think, you know, you just keep reading and get better. I mean, I once said to people that are reading something, you know, that uh, swimming on highway end took me nine years to write. And somebody said, Oh my gosh, nine years. And, and I could never start anything that took nine years. And I said, you know, well, if you expect not to live that long, I understand it. But otherwise, you know, if you write a novel, then nine years from now, you'll have one. But if you don't start nine years from now, you won't have one. Um, so so I, I guess that's that's mostly my advice. I know it sounds, you know, facetious, but it, but it's not. You just do it. That's all there is to it. I do want to chime in and say that this is why I treasure and value my time that I spent with you, Mary. You were pretty much the perfect like mentor for me. So I mean, I just wanted to say again, I appreciate you, and that is that's gold. <laughs> Rosemary, anything to add? Well, basically, what Mary said, you you need to treat your writing like it's an important thing and set time aside for it, like you would an appointment. Uh, uh, an important appointment and try not to crowd that story out by less trivial things. And another thing is to trust yourself and don't want other people's opinion all the time. But when you do ask for opinion, get someone who's smart enough to read your work with sensitivity and to give you some honest feedback. Don't look for false praise because you won't be able to guide yourself the way you need to be guided. So choose your readers. And at some point, don't ask for everything they have to say. Ask for the two or three things that you know you need to know. Because you know, as you're writing, you think, well, I'm afraid this part isn't any good. Then ask and be willing to hear the answer. Great. Well, thank you guys so much. I think we're going to bring Alex back in. But I just had to say the most Missouri moment of any of the collections for me, Mary, came from yours when your character Henrietta said, You've been living here 87 years in the Midwest and you consider still consider the cold of January worthy of comment like it's a news flash. And I <laughs> loved, loved, loved that moment. How we have not as Missourians ever not comment on the weather. Yeah, right. Thank you. Alex, you are still muted, my dear. Alex, you're muted. Um, so I was just saying, I've lived here for 18 years and I'm still stunned every <laughs> winter. It's like, what, what's going on? This is... <laughs> well, thank you all so much for a wonderful conversation. Um, Mary asked Missouri, what can you offer? And the answer clearly is brilliant, simple <laughs> conversation. Uh, that was so wonderful. Uh, Rosemary, Mary, and Ron, thank you all so very much for a wonderful night. Uh, the winner this evening is Marcia Lake. Uh, Marcia, if you want to send an email, please, to mail at unboundbookfestival.com. Uh, let us know your address, and we will get those books to you. You are in for an absolute treat there. Really. Um, again, thank you to our sponsor, uh, Restoration Eye Care. We are back to our usual Tuesday and Thursday night schedule next week. Uh, on Tuesday, we have a very interesting discussion about the changing landscape in YA fiction. And on Thursday, we have possibly our most intriguing poetry reading of the year, which is poetry from people working in the healthcare field. And I do hope you'll be able to join us for both of those. 
Thank you again to our wonderful pan panelists. Thank you, Becky, for a wonderful job in moderating. Thank you all very much for listening. We'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, Alex.